think, uh, I think um, first of all, uh, your test will be delayed. I think it's on the schedule. It's pretty soon. We haven't gotten through everything yet, so uh, stay apprised of that. Uh, I posted on Blackboard. Did folks see last night that I posted on Blackboard just the playlist? I was getting some emails from folks saying they were having a hard time finding it. Uh, so I figured I'd just go ahead and put it there <clears throat> for you to get to. Um, and the video from yesterday is not posted yet. I should try to, I'll try to get that up probably at the end of the day uh, today. Uh, the one up from the one from Tuesday I just posted last night, uh, right before I sent that playlist link out. So if you haven't seen that, go ahead and take a look. Uh, so we're going to be jumping in the middle of some stuff that you guys haven't necessarily heard a lot about, but uh, I'll try to give you a little bit. Um, I'll try to give you a little bit of a recap so that uh, you can at least know what we're talking about. Uh, what was the last thing? We talked about the here. The last thing that you guys were here for. Responses, defense mechanisms. Uh, defense mechanisms? Yeah. Okay. So we had already started talking about some of the defense mechanisms. I think it was your class we didn't get through all of them, but we've just gotten started. Is this right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we got through those. What you'll see in the, in the video from yesterday and the day before <clears throat> uh, is that we went ahead and finished out that list and then we started talking about something uh, called psychosexual stages. This is still a Freudian uh, theory and we're still of course talking about personality. Uh, so Freud had a lot of different ways that he tried to understand personality. He had a lot of different ways uh, in which he conceptualized not only what personality looks like in terms of its makeup uh, in the mind, but also uh, in terms of how a person's personality comes to be. So what we're going to look at here in the psychosexual stages is really something that we call a developmental model. And when we get to the development section, uh, we'll see a couple, at least one more, maybe a couple more of these. <clears throat> and basically what it's going to look like is just looking at what are the different ages at which certain things are beginning to come online, beginning to develop. When we look at this in the development step section, we're really going to be looking at cognitive development. So basically, how do we become smart? How do we begin to figure out the things that we as humans can figure out? <clears throat> this stage model, of course, is going to be for personality. So what Freud was interested in, in really what psychodynamic or psychoanalytic psychology is interested in psychoanalytic psychology is interested in is how your history which we're going to talk about affects your unconscious and in some ways your conscious conscious such that you develop certain personality characteristics now again, back in Freud's time, the psychology model was really just interested in abnormal psychology, right? You had normal folks and you had abnormal folks. We weren't yet thinking about strengths and talents, right? We were only really thinking about we've got normal people and how can they go wrong? How can they be abnormal? And so this developmental model, while it is looking at personality, it's not going to necessarily look at personality in a neutral way. It's going to look at personality in terms of here's how you raise or here's how you raise or rear, I guess, a normal kid. And here's some stuff that you can do to really screw them up. So there's not, again, really this, this kid will be good at this. It's really 
This kid will be bad at that. Anybody a parent in here? No? Okay, so we'll just have to rely on our imagination. Um, in yesterday's class, I think I had a parent, so it's always nice to ask, did this happen at this age? All right, so the first part of this is looking at what age certain things occur. The next is what we're just gonna call the stage. And this focuses on <clears throat> a particular body part, I guess you could call it, uh, that Freud says children are seeking sexual pleasure from at, at this particular age. Now Freud's gonna say sexual pleasure because he's Freud, but <clears throat> also because Freud is making known, and this is something that modern science uh, has demonstrated, or at least also theorized, that children don't really have a distinction between types of pleasure. So this isn't like an adult understanding sexual pleasure. This is the kid doesn't understand the difference between something tastes good, something smells good, something feels good, and what we would consider uh, some type of sexual pleasure. So there's not this distinction uh, for them. So Freud is going to say that this is where the child is deriving sexual pleasure at this age, but really he just means their energy is devoted there. Their focus uh, is devoted there. Then we're going to look at what the analogy is for this particular body part. One thing that folks get wrong about these psychosexual stages is they stop at that sort of sexual pleasure piece. Right? And that means some things, but really it's about the analogy. Really it's about what Freud is saying this says about the person's unconscious, not so much about what body parts are involved. And this analogy will be connected to some type of complex or fixation. Okay. So from the ages of 0 to 18 months, children are in what Freud called the oral stage of development. You guys must know kids, at least met one or two. What about this age range? Just on the face of it, do you think Freud is talking about when he says oral? Yes. They're discovering different ways of communication. Okay, they're discovering different ways of communication, right? They're starting this, this journey on how do I let mom know I'm unhappy or hungry? Good, yep. They like suck their thumb or suck on like a pinky. Okay, so they're like, enjoy, like, I don't know how to say it. Like, they just enjoy having stuff in their mouth, I guess. That's right. So they sort of enjoy just having stuff in their mouth. What does this look like? When they explore new things, it's always like, they put it in their mouth and feel like it. Very good. So the first thing a kid often does when they get a new object is, right, put it in their mouth. If you've never seen, you know, a one-year-old and give them a ball or a toy or a mud pie, right? They're just going to put it in their mouth, right? It's just the first way they're going to try to experience that thing. Uh, what else in particular? In terms of human development, what else in particular? Yeah. Teething. What's that? Teething. They're teething, right? And so here's this very literal, literal, this, here's this very literal developmental stage or this very literal uh, developmental moment in the child's life where this is something important that's happening, right? The child is teething. The parents will get excited. Ooh, he's teething. Solid food. What do you think all of this means in terms of an analogy? That is to say, what is important? What is the kid broadly figuring out about the world in terms of all of the things that we just mentioned? 
communication, putting things in their mouth, needing to be fed, teething. Okay, how to use their mouth, sure. Well, what the kid is figuring out is if the world is a safe place. He's testing safety, we could say. What does that mean? Well, generally this is gonna require a couple of guardians, or at least one guardian, somebody looking out for the kid's welfare because if you've got a kid who is not in an environment where the parents are, you know, being attentive, they might let the kid cry and cry and cry and cry and cry before they feed him. They might let the kid find something dangerous in the medicine cabinet or in the cleaning cupboard and put it in their mouth. Right? They might let the kid, they may not soothe the kid, I guess I should say, when he's teething. And he's crying in agony, right? Most parents are going to try to give the kid something to suck on, a teething ring or a piece of ice or something like that, right? But there are all of these ways in which the kid is finding out, is this a safe place? Is this a place where my needs are going to be met? Is this a place where I'm going to be cared for? This is the first thing the child has to learn, is, is this place safe? So what happens uh, if that goes wrong? What type of person do you get if they think that the world is in a safe place or that people aren't going to care for them? Anxious. What's that? Anxious. You'll get a sort of anxious person, very good, but it's a particular kind of anxiety. Or very cautious. Cautious? That might come in the next stage, hold that thought. They don't trust people. They don't trust people. Here's what we're looking for. You're probably going to get the type of person who either doesn't trust people or the type of person who is, is really anxious about their trust with people. There's a particular fixation that comes from this stage. Giving you the answer. What's it called? Oral fixation. It's called an oral fixation. What is an oral fixation? Is it just like the desire and like the comfort of like stimulating your mouth, basically? Okay. So it's it's about something about stimulating your mouth. Mm -hmm. What are some things that a person does if they have an oral fixation? What are some things that we observe a person doing if we think they have an oral fixation? What's that? Yeah, chew on things like Chewing on things like what? Like a pen or a pencil, yep. Yeah. Uh, biting the nails. Biting the nails, yep. What else? Talking a lot. Talking a lot, yep. What else? Yep. Like grinding your teeth. Grinding your teeth, very good. What else? If they have an oral fixation that's based on safety, would they require others to verbally confirm that they're trustworthy or not? Okay, they might need a lot of verbal confirmation. I like this. You're expanding. I like you got this idea of analogy. Very good. What else? They eat a lot. They might eat a lot. Very good. Comfort eating. No, about that. What else? Anybody? Smoking cigarettes, very good. Sucking their thumb, right? Then there's the sexual one. What do all of these things have in common? Teasing mouth. What's that? Teasing mouth. Teasing mouth. This guy's very little. What else? What What are all of the all of these things used to do for that individual? To comfort, them. To comfort right? And here's what we're looking for. Here's the connection that Freud is making. That folks who have this oral fixation are, are really just trying to comfort themselves. Whether you're smoking, sucking your thumb, overeating, right? All of these things, talking a lot for confirmation or needing confirmation for, from others. All of these things are things a person is doing to care for themselves, to get that care that maybe they think they were missing in their childhood, or maybe they're the type of person who has sort of a needy 
disposition. And so they feel like they need all of this, all of this care coming in, whether they're getting it or not, they feel like they need the extra help, they need to eat more, they need to talk more, et cetera. Does this make sense? This idea of an oral fixation, right? Again, Freud connecting it to something that's happening in your childhood that's going on in your unconscious, right? These people that are biting their fingernails may have some sense that they're anxious, but they don't necessarily know that it's because, I don't know, they could use a hug, right? But they are demonstrating this fixation uh, in, in their life. Yes, sir? Is it possible to develop this at like later stages of life? Sure, great question. Um, I think that Freud would say a true oral fixation, no, right? That perhaps you exist on some broad continuum of, of the oral fixation scale, right? But that if you get particularly stressed in your life, right? If you're feeling particularly needy or alone in your life, right? That you might engage in more of these behaviors than you would at a, a regular time. So there's some variability from person to person where some people are just gonna have an oral fixation. And then there's some folks who are, you know, they get nervous for a test and they chew on their pencil. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, psychoanalytic psychology really connects the idea with feeding, uh, the idea of feeding with, with care, with giving care. And I like to just give the analogy of, you know, even if it's something small, like you're hanging out uh, with some buddies and one of them disappears to the kitchen and brings out a plate full of sandwiches that they want. Like, wow, well, that's nice. You didn't have to do that, right? That food, sort of feeding someone else, is this way of communicating uh, care. Even if they just order a pizza, bring a uh, bag of popcorn. Questions? From 18 to 36 months, uh, what's going on at this age? One and a half, three years old. Anybody babysit or anything? What are kids going through at this age? What's that? The terrible twos. That's great. That is happening here. We're going to see maybe why in a little bit. Um, it's just this idea that when a kid's around two and they're a toddler, they start and this could be connected, really testing boundaries, they start acting out, they start, you know, just not being a cute kid who's, yes, mommy, but no, you know, that kid. <laughs> what else is going on at this age? Potty training. There we go. Potty training. So what might we call this stage? It's got a similar theme. You got it? There is the anal stage. <clears throat> so potty training is really the critical kind of keystone here, this, this kind of critical moment in the way that teething is sort of the critical moment here, though broadly the whole phase has some effects. But with potty training, what, what does a kid have to, to do to learn to be potty trained? What's the first thing that they have to do? Very good. You just have to notice that thing, that before, how do you handle it? Just go when you go. You just go, it just goes right through you. Right? There's no sort of stop button, there's no sort of awareness. It's just like, yeah, that's happening, right? So you got to have this awareness and then what? You have to realize that you, right? Some people don't want you to do it on their own. Okay, so you have maybe this notion of, okay, maybe I shouldn't just go right here, right now. Yeah. And then what? You know, you go to the bathroom. There's something else. You're not going to make it if you don't do this other thing. Hold it in. What? Hold it in. Hold it. Right? Do not go to the bathroom. This is the first time, probably, certainly in a repeated way, right, in a way that the parents or whomever is raising this child is going to stress. This is probably the first time 
that the kid has been asked to control himself, right? This is probably the first time that a parent has demanded, perhaps, or at least asked, that the kid over and over and over not do this particular thing that they feel like they want to do, right? Before this, when the kid's won and you don't want them doing something, right? Billy, stop playing with that truck. We have to leave. You're going to break it, whatever it is. You're just going to tell them to stop and going to stop? How do you handle that? Usually you have to tell them no or like smack their hand or something. Sure, they cry and then they stop crying and they take the truck back. How do you handle this? You take it away, right? You do not trust them to make their own decision. My point here is just that before this, you're probably just doing everything, stuff that they mess up on, stuff that they can't handle, right? You're just gonna do it. You're just gonna make it impossible for them to read. You're just gonna get them the thing that they want, right? You're just gonna let them cry. But here, this isn't gonna go, right? Here, I know you're crying, but you, you know, we've gotta get this. Maybe not that day, but at some point, it's gonna be very important. If you're four and a half, <laughs> you know, you're still in diapers. So this is the first time that the kid has been asked to control himself. And so, of course, this phase is about self-control. This is the first time the kid is encountering this because here's a thing that only he or she can control. And because of that, the, the mom or dad, they can't do it for them. They can't just take it out of the way. They have to say, you, you have to learn this. This is something that you're going to have to handle. So let's say that uh, you took Dr. Gordon's psychology class when you were in college, and now you've got a kid. And you're saying to yourself, I remember that Dr. Gordon said that these are some important phases and that a kid's got to learn how to potty, be potty trained by 18 months or terrible things could happen. And so you get your 18 year month old kid and you take them and you say, listen, we're gonna learn to potty train today. This is really important. And when they don't get it right, you get upset, you send them to the corner, they're in trouble. When they do get it right, you get really, really excited. This is so great, you're such a good kid. And then they mess up again. And what's wrong with you? What's this teaching the kid about self-control? the kid learning about the importance of control? What's that? Consequences, very good. What else? In this particular lesson, with this particular parent, what's this kid learning about control? They, they can like get a rise out of people if they don't do what they're told. That's an advanced kid, right? They're already thinking mind games. <laughs> Look how mad mom gets when I poop on the floor. <laughs> what, what else though? So kids at this age, they just met you. You know, you're their mom, but they, they just met you. Okay? They don't know how love works. They don't even know how pleasure works. Right? And so they see you getting upset the first time. Because they have to do something that, that they're figuring out. This is, this is new. This is all new. You're new. This whole pooping thing, this is new. And they see you getting really, really upset about this thing. Well, kids don't understand love. They don't understand, certainly, unconditional love. So the message they may take home from this is, if I don't get this right, mom's not going to love me anymore. This seems to be really important. She's getting really upset when I poop in her diaper. She's getting really upset when I don't get up and go to the park. So how's this gonna affect this person's behavior going forward? Self-control is really important. Control is really important. What type of person is this? anal personality. This is where we get the term. It's short for, it's not how you spell it. It's 
short for anal retentive. Constantly. What's an anal retentive person like? What's that? Like control things and do everything how they want it. Right. They like to be in control. They like to have everything how they want it. Anything else? They stress over the little things. They stress over little things. Right? Oh, you made a mess in here. There's like three dog hairs. Right? So it's just this idea, of course. That this person at this age, this child at this age, learning self-control this first time in the potty training uh, experience, of course, but also uh, just just in that in that time of life, right? The terrible twos. The kid is acting out broadly. The kid is, you know, pushing the boundaries broadly, and so the parent is probably also asking the kid some exercise and control in those moments. So while the potty training piece again is a nice little analogy, is a nice focus. It really is about this broader range of the age, right? The kids are doing things to test the boundaries. Kids are having to learn broadly to control themselves, to share, right? This is the share age, right? Where you have to teach kids to do things that they aren't naturally necessarily doing. And so with that, they learn the importance of rules and the importance of control. On the other hand, what happens if you've got a parent who's like, yeah, man, I took Dr. Gordon's class and I listened to most of it. And I heard that 36 months is when kids are supposed to be potty trained. But I also heard that if you potty train them too early, they can go wacko. And so I'm gonna give my kid like a few extra months. We'll start at 38 months training this guy. And listen, if he poops on the floor, no big deal. Like, I'm going to clean it up. I'm his dad. If it takes him a couple years, whatever. What's this kid learning about self-control? How to not have it. Close. Not, not how to not have it. It's not necessary or it's not as, like, uh, important. It's not important, right? Control's not important. Somebody's gonna come along and clean it up for me. Somebody's gonna come along and do it. Mommy and daddy are gonna love me no matter how badly I screw up. Right, all of these things, given, given the counter message or the opposite message as this person who we would call anal retentive, we call this person, this is my favorite, anal expulsive. <laughs> Constipation. And diarrhea. Questions? The next stage goes from three to six years and is known as the phallic stage. What is a phallic? Like the lower region. Say what? Implies the lower region. What's that? Implies the lower region. It implies the lower region. I love your modesty. And that'll work in a couple more stages, but in this stage it implies a particular part of the lower region. Genital. It implies a particular genital. <laughs> Phallic. Um, it basically means penis, but uh, not exactly. It really shapes. It really shapes. It really refers to the shape or kind of implication of a penis. The Washington Monument is a phallic symbol. Right. So it means penis, but it doesn't exactly mean penis. It means the idea of it, if you will. What's going on in this stage that uh, Freud would have named it the phallic stage? This will be probably particularly um, noticeable on little boys at this age. I should note that this stage 
is pretty sexist in the sense that he really is only thinking about boys. He's really not thinking about girls at all. Is it like them becoming more aware of like, like playing with and more being more aware of the fact that they have genitals? Okay, so I mean, what? So you've seen maybe kids do this. If anybody's yeah. seen three to six year old boys, they will often have their pants in their pants if they have pants on at all. This is the run around naked mommy look at my wheelie stage. Anybody know kids like this? Maybe they were kids like this. Right. So this is the age where kids are starting to get, um, I'm curious isn't the right word, but they're starting to notice the, these differences. And there is some curiosity, but it's really more of an off-put curiosity, right? This is also the cooties age, right? Getting up to five and six, we're getting to girls are icky. Age. So there isn't the curiosity that you would expect in an adolescent, but there is the what is that type of curiosity. So what children are learning in the phallic stage are about power and difference. In particular here with regard to uh, gender differences. So there's a couple uh, really important things that happen here. And Freud does talk a little bit about what's going on for girls. Um, and in particular, the fact that, well, what's a little girl gonna think the first time at this age, certainly, that she sees a boy or a man naked? How's that gonna go? How? Okay. Say more. Um, I mean, especially with a man, like I feel like that'd be really shocking. And Make it a boy. I, I was just trying to, because sometimes it, it's it's probably going to be dad, right? The, the first time. Uh, but let's say it's a brother. It's an older brother. He's he's going to probably recognize wow. that looks very different from what like, from what hers looks like. Uh -huh. You notice it looks very different, right? In fact, it might feel something like, what the hell is this? What the hell is that? What's it gonna be like for a boy who sees a naked girl for the first time? Where did your penis go? <laughs> right. That there's gonna be this sort of stark observation of this difference. It is going to be surprising, right? And it is going to be something that the kid is pretty aware of. Again, especially at this age where they're paying attention to such things. So again, we can have a sort of complex come out of this, this stage with, re with relation uh, to the penis or the phallus. And again, you can see here maybe a little bit why Freud is focused on the phallic stage, why he's calling it the phallic stage, because he's picturing it as this observation of having or not having a penis, right? That this is really what he thinks this stage is about. This is how he's setting up that idea of difference. But again, if you think of kids at that age, you're noticing or you can notice that they're aware of this difference on a lot of levels. Mommy pink is for girls. I'm not aware of that. That's a girl's butt, right? So, for girls, Freud said that a complex in this stage would look like something he called penis envy. What's he talking about? What do we mean by penis envy in terms of some type of analogy? Boys have something they don't. Boys have something they don't? What's that mean? Girls aren't penis. I mean, that's the literal, yes. What's the analogy? Yes, ma'am, in the wood. What's the analogy? That's you. Yeah. Uh, jealousy? What type of jealousy? Also remember, this is the 1920s, <laughs> okay? 
What type of job? Like work comes in, you get to do the balloon and jump. You That's it, right? I told you it was sexist. So this is Freud saying, right, that girls noticing that boys don't have a penis might begin to connect this idea that boys get some more stuff that girls don't get, especially in the 1920s, that men get some stuff that women don't get, right? And he cast this sense that girls or women who aspired to be powerful or aspired to be in charge or aspired to be something other than a 1920s housewife, well, they just have penis in them. You just want to be a man, right? It's sexist. But here we are. What do we, what we call it nowadays? What would we call what nowadays? Instead of penis, then it makes it absurd and not the case. What would, what would the actual term nowadays be? Well, I mean, it would still be penis envy. And I think that you, I think there are some things that you could separate out of that that aren't quite sexist, right? If you just think about different roles that aren't necessarily po power differential, but just things that maybe men get to do, right? And it could be a literal jealousy over a particular man, your brother or your husband, right? So I think there are some ways that you could still call a thing penis envy, but Freud's broad take on it was, you know, women want to leave the house. They must be, they must be nuts. Something in their childhood. Well, what's going on wrong at this stage? Oh, uh, what's going wrong at this stage is that the girl can't get over the fact that her, her brother's got got something, and that must mean, right, mommy, how come I don't get to, right? So, uh, he would have also talked about these girls like tomboys, right, that these are the girls who are rough and tumble, want to play with the boys, right, that's kind of that immediate uh, penis envy uh, in, in the younger, in the younger one. So what's going on for boys? <laughs> if girls see that a little boy has a penis and maybe wants one, right, it gets them all these special things. <laughs> what's a boy think when he sees a girl does not have one? What could go wrong there? Power tripping. Say what? Power tripping. Um, hold on to that. What's what's gonna go wrong? For the boy, not power tripping, not not at the young age, not yet. May result in power tripping. Feel better? He's gonna be like, I have this, you don't. No, <laughs> which I appreciate. Yeah. Mom, um, that key doesn't have a penis. Am is mine gonna fall off? Boys can be worried that they will lose their penis. This is what Freud would say. Right. He calls this castration anxiety. This fear that, right, they just got here. Even at six, they kind of just still got here. I don't know that gender is stable. I don't know that girls are always girls and don't grow up into men. I don't know that. I don't know that I can't wake up and be a girl tomorrow. Is that what happened to Becky? Was, when she was born, was she a boy? Right, like this is how kids, mine could go, right? Not every little boy's gonna have this, uh, have this anxiety, but some do. Or maybe just some broad worry about their penis, not necessarily that it's gonna fall off, but you know, some worry about it. What's this look like in a man? Self-consciously, or just like, shy? Yeah, maybe, but probably not. I feel like they'd be kind of like a pig. Like so they'd be like, they'd be kind of, um, I don't know, I don't feel like they'd be a very tasteful person to be around. <laughs> <laughs> why, what do you mean tasteful and why? Because I feel like they would always be trying to assert like the fact that they still have their penis and like their, I don't know. This is right. Right. What we would expect to see out of a boy uh, who had a castration 
anxiety as a child is this over assertion, this attempt to over assert his manhood, right? This sort of superiority complex around it, right? With the understanding that behind this superiority, superiority complex is almost always an inferiority complex. You're not going to take my manhood from me. In fact, it's a bit of a reaction formation, really, right? If you guys saw that video where you kind of do the opposite of how you feel. And so I'm going to overly assert my manhood. What's this look like? Maybe a big truck, show them how strong I am, right? This is what we're talking about. This sort of over the exertion of one's masculinity, right? Might be a big truck, might be that you're really aggressive, you're the kind of guy who punches the walls, throws temper tantrums, right? Wouldn't be caught dead in a pink shirt, right? This guy. This is the castration. Questions so far? So this phallic stage has a lot going on. There's another point of it, a whole other thing that's going on. Known as the Oedipus complex. Anybody know the story of O Oedipus? Tell us the story of that. Uh, basically, the king and queen of a, a nation for a son and a great seer were told that he would kill his father. So in order to prevent it, his father sends him away. But as he grows up, one day he decides to go to the kingdom. Or, well, he survives somehow. I don't know the full story. But basically, he goes to the kingdom, meets his father unknowingly on the road. And the two have an argument, which turns into a battle of death. He kills his father goes back to the kingdom, marries his mother, fucks her, has kids. She ends up killing herself once she finds out he's her, or yeah, he's her son. Yeah. And then to, what is it, to like punish himself for this, he cuts out his eyes or something. And then there's this whole other set of series about his daughters that were born. Antigone. Yeah. Very good. I like this. Uh, yeah, so Oedipus, you guys hear that? Prince, supposed to kill his parents. Ends up killing him anyway, or at least killing his dad anyway, um, and marrying his mother. So this is going to be interesting, huh? <laughs> so what's going on in the Oedipus complex? Freud says that this is co-occurring. This is happening within the phallic stage. Is that boys, again here we're going to focus on boys. Boys are in love with their mothers. Again, following up from these previous stages where we talk about the children don't really have a sense of the different types of love, right? They don't understand romantic love versus familial love. And so boys are in love with their mothers. It feels like romantic love. Or they can't tell the difference. But it's just as powerful. Who's in the way? Dad. Dad's in the way. She's kissing on him all the time. She'll put me down and then go kiss on dad or make him a sandwich. That's ridiculous. She's beating me. I am the love of her life. And she is the love of mine. Right? This is the complex. Dad's in the way. I love mom. What are we going to do about this? Well, what can the kid do, really? Nothing. Nothing. Or he can't really do anything. He can't kill dad. Dad's bigger than him, stronger. Mom's not going to like that much, probably. So he decides the way that this complex is supposed to be, according to Freud, resolved is that he decides if I can't beat my dad, I will join him. And this is supposed to represent the gender of the child, right? that at around age six, the child decides to, to remove himself to some degree, not entirely, from his mother, and to align himself more with his father. What's that look like? What are six-year-old boys doing that maybe demonstrates this 
alignment with their father. Wearing their father's clothes. Wearing dad's clothes. Very good. What else? So I just do everything he does. Like I want my coffee in the morning because dad brings coffee and stuff like that. That's right. So maybe follow him around. Got the cup. Dad puts orange juice in it, but you feel like you're drinking coffee with dad, right? What else? Shaving in the mirror with him, right? Dad gives you one without a blade in it. Put shaving cream on your face. Wanting to do the lawn work with him, right? Wanting to go to work with him. All of this stuff is going to happen around this age. And Freud is saying, right, it's because of this complex. It's because they've resolved this complex. And in order to get a woman like their mother, they're going to have to be what? A man like their dad. They're going to have to change into this type of guy to get this type of woman. And here's where this idea that you date people that remind you of your parents comes from. Because you still, if you're a boy, and you like women, you are still in love with your mother. You're really not over it. But you've made this pact in your mind with your father, and so you're just going to get a woman like your mother. Never mind, I'll find someone like you. Yes, sir? So you said that when the boy like starts mimicking what looks like his father, that's how you resolve it? Do people, like, does that not get resolved in some boys? If Freud would say yes. Uh, Freud would say it does not uh, get resolved in some boys. We're going to get into some, I don't know, homophobic, I guess, stuff here. All right, Freud says uh, that this is how you create, uh, if they do not resolve this, a mama's boy. What he also might have called a sister. This isn't, this isn't modern psychology, please understand, okay? But this is just how he sort of conceptualized that, right? He does go through the trouble of saying, hey, what happens if you don't resolve complexes? And so here he says, this is what happens to a, a man who never aligns with his father, is that he's sort of just about really, really focused on his mom, really focused on uh, pleasing his mom. <clears throat> um, I think even though this isn't, uh, even though this isn't a girl or woman focused uh, theory, he would still have said that this is a daddy's girl or again, as I said, um, in childhood, right, a tomboy. Yep. So you said that this is like a scale. So like at one end is obviously kill your dad, take your mother. So I'm assuming at the other end would be like kill your mother, take your dad. But then like if you're dead center, then you wouldn't have any sort of Oedipus complex. What does that look like? What do you mean? If you loved your mom and dad equally? Yeah, but you like, like you don't, like there's no like need to kill either one. Like, how does, how would that manifest if you're kind of like dead hand center, almost like you know, if it's a scale and like you know, zero in the center goes out either way. What does that midpoint look like? You mean what happens if a kid does not have strong affection towards one parent or the other? Yeah. Um, I feel like that's probably pretty di pretty difficult to pull off. Uh, I feel like most children are going to be connected to their mother more at this early age by the nature of biology, right? I mean, there may be some different circumstances in terms of what a person's kind of upbringing was like, but in very most cases, right, it's the mom who's taking care of them. And even if it's not, right, the child is still going to have this connection with the mom by virtue of having lived in their body. Well, for nine I mean, like, let's just say, like, for whatever reason, like, maybe they just didn't associate that or whatever, but they're dead sent. What would that look like? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, do you have an idea? I feel like it would just make them empathetic almost because they really don't know how to associate feeling towards one another. So it's just going to say, well, this is a feeling, and that's kind of what it is. Sure. But I just, I'm just kind of curious because if it, if, the idea of the Oedipus complex kind of forms your how you what you view is what you want sexually, and you can't really do that if you're kind of like dead hand. You know what I mean? Are you asking about? This sounds like a great thought paper, first of all, um, and I wonder if you're sort of thinking about asexuals and how that 
No. Maybe lines itself. Not not asexual is more like gender fluid. No. Like empathetic type people. Apathetic. Like, yeah. Sorry, apathetic. Um, um. Kind of. Oh, that's up here. That's up there. Okay. Yeah. The world's not safe. Nobody's gonna take care of me. Then fuck them. I'll do it myself. I'll kill you if I need to eat. So right. this, more, this is where that comes no, from. I'm talking more like the people that are like, it's not the safety of the world, it's more they just can't connect to others, so they don't, they oh, don't, like, they don't associate. So I guess, I guess it's I understand. Like, that is probably happening up here too. There's, um, if, if you're curious, there's a personality disorder uh, called a schizoid uh, personality disorder. Have you heard of this? Schizophrenia? No, schizoid. Okay. Different. Um, it's a personality disorder. Uh, and these are people who do not care to be in a relationship. Like, it doesn't bother them, they're not hung up on it, they can fake it if they need to, but they just don't prefer it. They would really just rather be alone and not involved with people. Um, and this is probably still gonna be something um, at this very, very early stage, because that idea of human connection is set in pre pretty early in a, in a child's life, just in terms of this is an important need and if you're gonna get it, you need to get it right away. And so it might not be the same thing that happens in terms of developing something like sociopathy or um, psychopathy, but it is gonna be probably, we don't know, but it is probably gonna be something in that very early stage of the person's life where they're just figuring out how to have relationships. Yeah? So if people were like gay, did they like, like for example, would I have that head of this conflict with like my father? Um, that is a great question. And again, Freud did not really say much about uh, gays and lesbians. Uh, this is a critique of Freud. I mean, he didn't necessarily say anything negative, unless right this. But these are just terms that we've associated negative these days. What's wrong with the tomboy? Um, and so he didn't really say anything about that. There is this, this connection that some people have made, and maybe even Freud made it once, that gay men tend to have overbearing mothers that results in this kind of mama's boy complex that doesn't allow them to sexual, whatever. It, no, it's bullshit. But that's what he would have said, right? And, and again, he didn't really think about it much, so he probably would have been kind of just working his way through it to answer the question as I am doing now. But he didn't say much about it, um, distinctly. <clears throat> um, but that's an interesting thought paper, right? Just maybe conceptualizing how that, and how that looks. I wonder if anybody's done a study. Do gay men prefer guys like their dads? I've never seen it. Um, okay, so we got through this, did I tell you everything? There's, there is something called the Electra Complex Uh, that is a similar story to Oedipus's story, uh, but with the with the uh, sexes switched, uh, such that the woman kills her mother and aligns herself with uh, by the way, right, kills her father and uh, falls in love with her dad. I think I said it wrong, Steve, but you know what I mean. Kills her mother, falls in love with her dad. That one. Uh, do you know this story? I I've heard of it. But I think it was just kind of like said, oh, it's the other way around. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it sounds like you've read this one. I've read this one too. I haven't, I haven't read this one. So, same thing. I just know it's the other way around. Uh, but this, this electro complex was done later. This isn't actually Freud's work. Uh, somebody came along later and was like, hey, probably should have something for the women too, just in, in regard to how they uh, sort of gender themselves uh, in relation to their parents. Questions? Two more stages, okay. So uh, six years old, into puberty, 
we are in what's really called the latent stage. Uh, latent just means sleeping. Uh, and for Freud, this is kind of when you've got a kid that's just a full-grown kid and they're not really developing, they're just being kids, right? And so for Freud, this wasn't much of a critical period. Uh, again, latent means sleeping, and so he's really just kind of referring to this idea of that sexual energy that he's describing earlier is at bay. Yeah? Was this focused on, like, men, mostly? Because I think that's what Tom Trent said. So then would have to do the fact, because uh, I know three is six, is the development of um, genitals and all that, and then biologically, but then around six, and then up until 10 to 13, I think is the range, mm -hmm. there's no development at all. Is that, is that what you're talking about in men? He sort yeah. of probably following that. Freud was actually a physician by training. Yeah, because in women, it doesn't stop until they hit puberty, but then for men, there's a long period of- Interesting. Yeah. Where probably so, develop. probably. Uh, very much so. One interesting thing about psychology is that it is, it's, it's done by men mostly, certainly in the early days. That's not true anymore. Most psychologists are women, but uh, those early men mostly worked on women mm -hmm. because the clients they tended to get were husbands sending their wives to the psychologist because, you know, when I get home from my hard day at work, she's blah, 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 right? So he's going to, they get sexist in the 20s. But again, Freud was a physician, and so he's probably basing some of these more medicalized or at least biological uh, theories. He probably is basing them on his understanding of the physiology of humans. And so that would make sense if you're telling me that at this age, boys in particular are kind of latent biologically, or that girls so are mean, still. Hit puberty, there's so much change in them because it's just such, it's such a rapid movement. And that's for why boys? Also, yeah, it's also why there's a wider range for men. It can, go, it can go up until, I think, about 16, it, depending on how much they need to develop and how much wasn't developed before they stop. Sure. But then that's why they like have large amounts of testosterone and all of a sudden being uh, produced, and they don't understand what that is because that wasn't being produced even when they were originally developing. So it causes a lot of behavioral things like anger and aggression and uh, yeah. masturbation is one of the big things because they just don't know how to get rid of it otherwise. Interesting. So, so yeah, I mean, that's great to know. I mean, the, I, I hadn't understood or at least knew that piece about the, the development or at least the difference between when boys and girls are developing. The girls are developing, it sounds like, somewhat through this stage, whereas boys have this kind of breaking point uh, in that development. Again, Freud said that we're kind of just latent in this stage, but um, some other researchers have come along later and noticed that in particular for boys, now this research uh, looked for girls or looked for this effect in girls, but did not find it. But that in particular for boys, uh, this seems to be the age in which if you're gonna get one, you're gonna, develop a fetish. And here we mean a proper fetish. Um, we're, what's that? Oh, you don't have to ask, yeah. Uh, so here we mean a, a proper fetish. That is to say, not just kind of kink or uh, S&M or anything like that. A, a proper fetish is someone that has a sexual attraction to something that is not a sexual object, right? The easiest and maybe most well-known fetish, something like a shoe fetish. A shoe turns me on, uh, right? That idea that it's not a sexual being, it's not a body part, or it's not even a sexual body part, it's just this inanimate object and I have a sexual attraction to it. This is a true fetish. Turns out only men get fetishes. There's been no demonstrated case of a woman having a true fetish. This is only something guys can do, apparently. Seems to be because during this latent stage, even though they're maybe not outwardly sexual, or it sounds like inwardly, biologically, developing sexually, there is something that's going on in their mind where they're developing what we call a sexual repertoire. Check my spelling. 
conceptual repertoire. This is to say, the kids figuring out what is sexual, what things are connected to eroticism in the world, but really for me. They're kind of putting these things together for themselves. And so what can happen, for instance, is as the kid is discovering his sexuality, let's say he's you know, getting that surge of uh, testosterone, he's getting up to, I don't know, 12, and he's starting to hit puberty, so he's getting this surge of testosterone. And the only place that he can find to masturbate is in his parents' shoe closet. And in there, mom's got all of these shoes on the wall. And so he's really just having this association, this learned association with eroticism, and in this case, shoes, such that shoes get locked in. This is the thing about fetishes. They get locked in as a sexual object. Women do not seem to have this locking in of sexuality. Women do not seem to have this is sexual and this is sexual always. They can sometimes go in and out of things that they find interest in. You often hear that women's sexuality is more fluid. This is what we mean by that. Whereas guys will like what they like, and that's it. Now, there may be some highs and lows in that, right? And you might find some things that were in this repertoire that you didn't know were in there. But in general, if you've never been turned on by a pair of shoes, you probably won't be. Um, there's a story I read about a kid who would wake up early and like go sneak under the table uh, sometimes for breakfast before his parents got up. And his parents sometimes would come in and start making out on the, at, the, at the kitchen table thinking uh, he was still asleep. And I think his mom uh, had a prosthetic leg. And so sure enough, right, he develops a sexual fetish for prostheses. I had another story about a guy who was, uh, he, he grew up in a house where they put like an internet, a parent blocker on the internet, right? And he's getting to this age where he's looking for adult content on the web. And so he can't get to anything except for these really obscure sites that for whatever reason don't get blocked by his uh, parents' blocker. This particular site that he found that he kind of liked was a site where they would have sex, but there was always a man laughing in the background. And so this heterosexual guy develops a fetish for men's laughter. Right? There's this way in which it seems like in this stage things can just get sort of trapped in that box. Right? And so folks can develop fetishes out of things that they are connecting to sexuality uh, in this age. Yeah. Do all men have, like, do all men have a fetish? No, I don't think that's true. Yep. Yeah. Does the fetish have to, like, for it to develop, does it, do they have to experience the thing constantly? So, like, you know, I'm not sure about that. Would, you have to, would it have to be a constant thing with the internet? Would it have to be, like, a constant thing? I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I, I think probably the repeated nature of it would drive it home a bit more, but especially if it's a kid's kind of first experience of sexuality, you can imagine that that's like, oh, that's what sex is, right? Or that's what it's supposed to feel like, or whatever it is. So I don't think it necessarily has to be repeated, though, uh, in both of these examples I've just given you, right? It's, it is something that was happening uh, more than once. So otherwise, nothing is really going on here. One of the things that Freud would say is that this is when the kid's personality uh, is gonna show up, right? That the stuff that was going on here in terms of forging who they're gonna be as a person, that by the time they're in this latent stage, you're gonna be able to see some of that. If you've got a kid who's really anal, if you've got a kid who, for whatever reason, right, needs things to be orderly, needs things to be the way that you said they were gonna be, right, you're gonna see that by the time the kid's six, seven. Right? You're gonna already see this type of personality on the kid. If you get a kid who's really needy, right, you're going to know this by the time the kid is six. This kid's going to be a needy kid already. And so Freud says in addition to kind of being in this latent stage, we later maybe think about some of these other things that 
kids are beginning to just demonstrate who they are as people. So just puberty onward into adulthood. Freud called this the genital stage. And it's really just a repeat of this, right? You're back to being sexual, coming out of that place that, um, at least for, for boys at this time, doesn't feel sexual. They're not necessarily aware of the sexual nature of things, though they are paying attention to them. But here we are back in adulthood, and if you've properly developed and made it through all the stages, you should be sexually attracted to genitals, right? But Croy says that as we're coming through this and kind of sexually focused on these different parts, the last phase is to land where we do as adults where these are the things that turn us on in addition, perhaps, to some of the stuff that you get trapped in up here. Questions? All right. Um, next time, uh, on Tuesday, I'll be talking about um, Jungian psychology, Jungian personality, which is my favorite uh, personality psychologist, my favorite psychologist broadly. Uh, we'll finally start talking about that my Briggs stuff that I asked you to do uh, at the very beginning because that's what uh, that's connected to. Uh, and so we will be done with Freud, and then when we're done with Jung, uh, that should probably be it for personality. I'll let you know about the test. All right, have a good weekend. We'll see you next week.